Hey guys, so today we are looking at Matthew 4 and Luke 4 and 5. And in these passages, um, we get a, a deeper dive into Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, which we glimpsed at in Mark 1. Um, and what's interesting is that he's confronted by Satan and uh, the devil tempts him and is, um, you know, battling him with all of these different um, allures. And Jesus always fights back with scripture. Um, and so we're going to look at that a little bit later. But um, just to keep that in the back of your mind, that Jesus knew um, the, the, the Bible very well, um, because he is the Bible. <laughs> um, he is the manifestation of um, all of God's word. But then in verse uh, 15 and 16, um, it says that Jesus is, um, he goes into the land of Galilee and um, makes his dwelling in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, um, those territories of the Old Testament um, tribes. And so it's interesting, he's actually fulfilling um, Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, which is then quoted in verse 15. It says, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, G Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light was has dawned. And so they're identifying this place, this place of Galilee, um, as being already a place of Gentiles, and that this is where um, Jesus would um, show his light. And so it's really cool, you know, centuries later um, that he's fulfilling these promises. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, verse 17, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is here, right? And so we remember um, earlier, John was saying, um, repent for the kingdom of God is coming. It's, it's on its way. And now Jesus is saying, it's here. I'm here. Um, and so there's this promise that um, everything is about to change. And so he goes and he starts ministering um, and he ministers to great crowds. And so in verse 23 through 25, um, he starts to heal people um, of seizures and paralytics and um, those with any kind of pain or sickness or affliction. Um, and he heals them all. Um, and this kind of reminds me of Isaiah 53, 5, where it says that the suffering servant who would die for the sins of his people, um, that it's by his wounds um, that we would be healed and it's by his stripes um, that we are, I'm totally blanking on that part. Um, either way, it's one or the other, <laughs> um, stripes were healed, um, wounds were set free from, um, yeah, totally blanking on that, but Isaiah 53, five, um, go and check that out. Uh, it's a great promise, um, for those who believe in, um, Adonai. And so then we jump forward to, uh, Luke four and in Luke four, uh, my, uh, little post-it note got taken off. Um, but in Luke 4, it starts out by saying, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Um, and so what's interesting is that Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is um, this happens at least nine different times in the Old Testament. So um, with Joseph in Genesis 41, with Joshua in Numbers 27, with da David in 1 Samuel 16, that's um, the, just a, a little smattering of, of um, these times where this happens. And so the Holy Spirit would... Um, fill someone, he would he would be um, poured out upon someone, and um, they would be given divine purpose to be able to accomplish whatever God's calling them to. Um, at this point, it's to go into the wilderness and to be tempted by the devil. Um, and so it seems like a really um, dangerous thing that God is doing, and yet um, he knows exactly what's, what's happening, um, and he's very intentional in doing so. And um, as we talked about earlier, Jesus is given temptations and he always fights back with scripture, right? Um, and so he quotes every time actually from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8, Deuteronomy 6, 13, and Deuteronomy 6, 16. Um, and so um, what, I, what I took away from this is that it's very important, not just that we know God's word, but with, that we know all of God's word, right? And so if you look at the Bible, this is, there's a bunch of study notes back here. So um, this isn't actually the Bible, it's just a bunch of notes, but this is the New Testament, right? And this is the Old Testament. It's about three times bigger. So three quarters of the Bible is Old Testament, right? And so if we don't know all of it, um, we're going to have a very small, a very improper view of who Jesus is and who God is. Because again, like, I, like I've been saying, the whole Old Testament is laying the foundation that the New Testament builds upon. And so if we don't understand the foundation, we don't understand the background and the history, then 
um, all of these references, all of these things that you know we're seeing um, as we walk through this together, um, none of these things are going to make sense to us because we're just going to think, oh yeah, some old guy said that at one point, and you know that's kind of cool. But um, but to to understand the the purpose and the reason as to why Jesus is doing this, the reason why, um, and and also just who we are as a people, like where did we come from? Um, what is our purpose in life? Those answers are found in the Old Testament, not the New Testament. The New Testament brings those to life and, and really refines them. Um, but if we don't understand, we won't get anything out of this, um, or very little actually. And and we and there's a much higher risk of getting the wrong thing out of it and misinterpreting what God is saying when we don't understand the full picture um, and we don't see it from a, a chronological lens from beginning to end. Um, and so just a little, just a little, uh, um, what do you call that? Soapbox. There you go. <laughs> uh, I will step off of it now. And and so what's interesting then is that Jesus is welcomed into a synagogue and he's asked to teach. Um, and he reads Isaiah 61 and uh, verse 1 and 2. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's what he's doing. That's what he's about to do um, at this at this point, because he kind of jumped back a little bit in time. Um, he's about to start doing this. And um, what's interesting is that he tells them then um, in verses 24 through 29 or so, um, that when, you know, he's, he's like, listen, there were a lot of widows in um, Israel during the days of Elijah, but he only healed um, a widow named um, only, only yeah, Zarephath um, in the land of Sidon. And that's in First Kings 17 and 18. And then also, you know, when Elisha was there, there were many lepers in Israel, but he only healed Naaman of the Syrians, right? And so he's talking about how, okay, like I've been called to bring blessing and bring righteousness and bring salvation and all of these things, but um, a lot of people in Israel don't have a heart to receive it. And so unless you are looking for me, unless you are willing to humble yourself and seek my help, like Naaman and like um, Zarephath did, you won't receive it. And so he's like, heart check here. And clearly their hearts are wrong because then there, it says that all in the synagogue were filled with wrath and they rose up trying to throw him off a cliff. Um, and so um, clearly not what Jesus is looking for in a, in a uh, humble, broken person. Um, and so that's a, a repeated thing that we'll see throughout um, as we read the New Testament. But um, then in, in Luke 5, uh, it says that um, Jesus is, you know, at the at the lake and he starts, you know, preaching on, on Peter's boat. And then he tells him to cast his nets and everything and miracles happen. And um, Peter says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And this is um, almost verbatim from Isaiah 6, 5, where um, Isaiah is thrust into the throne room and sees the Lord and is like, whoa, like depart from me, Lord. I am a, I am a sinful man. I cannot, be, I'm doomed, um, is what he says. He's like, I can't be here. Um, and so that's just a, another um, beautiful reality where, where Peter, yeah, Peter, Simon is realizing that Jesus is the Lord. Um, and so then um, in verse 14, uh, Jesus, you know, goes and he, he heals the leper um, and tells him, you know, go show yourself to the priest. And this is, um, you know, make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded. And this is all in Leviticus 14. Um, and so he's he's pointing people to fulfill the Old Testament law, but to not um, make an idol out of it. And then in um, verse 20 and 21, um, it says that, you know, these disciples um, are with Jesus and they're, you know, speaking and teaching in this house. And then a paralytic comes in um, and Jesus is able to read the minds of the Pharisees who began to question in their hearts, like, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Um, that's um, roughly referencing Isaiah 43, verse 25, where it talks about the Lord forgiving sins and um, healing iniquities and not remembering them. Um, and Jesus is like subtly saying, I am God. <laughs> um, so like, I can do these things because I am him. Um, and I know that's hard to understand at this point, but um, that's a reality. And and so then um, they start to question him about fasting because they're seeing um, his disciples eating and drinking. And um, Jesus says that, um, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days are coming when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast in those days. Um, and that reminds me of uh, Daniel 9, 26 about an anointed one, um, a, a Messiah um, being cut off. 
and being um, taken away from his people. And so um, he's he's really kind of kind of referencing this, but also um, within the the lens of I'm about to be crucified, I'm about to um, die, then rise again and go into heaven, and um, my disciples won't be with me. And so they will eventually fast and mourn, um, but not today. That's not the point. And um, in this whole um, kind of grand opus of, of chapter five, he is um, building up to this point where he says that um, an old garment um, cannot be rendered with a new piece, right? Because if you put a new, a new patch on an old garment, the patch is going to shrink up um, as it gets washed and it gets, you know, um, cold and everything. And so that patch is going to rip um, the, the old because it, it is already shrunk as much as it can. Um, and then the same way with a uh, wineskin. He says that you don't put new wine that's about to be fermented um, into an old wineskin that's already done as much um, shrinking as it can. Uh, because if you do that, then it's so stiff, it's not elastic anymore, it's going to burst. Right, and so he's saying that you guys are living out of the old covenant. You guys are expecting an old covenant salvation, and I'm come to bring a new covenant. Right, um, and so the new covenant does not mix with the old. Right, um, and yet at the same time, um, this should be familiar to us that that there's this longing for this new covenant, um, this new way of life, even though we've never experienced it, because that's how we were originally meant to be. The new covenant is actually the oldest covenant, the covenant with Adam, um, that you would walk in uh, the still of the day and the, the coolness of the, the afternoon with the Lord and that you would you know feast upon um, the beauties and the wonders of who he is and the fruits that he provides. And so that is, he's, he's restoring what was lost. He's not making something completely new. And again, that's why we have to know the Old Testament. Um, and so I was expecting this to be a really short video, but it ended up being really long. But um, either way, I just, um, I love the fact that um, in his presence, there is familiar newness.